All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 5, Section 4, and Section 5. Section 5 is brief, so we're going to cover both of them here. So beginning with 5.4, the destruction of the T and the Coercive Act. So recall from last section, and we'll get the right uh, color here, 5.4, that the Townsend Acts, which replaced the Stamp Act to raise revenue, had repealed all the taxes except for one crucial item, and that, of course, was T. And the fact that T, or the tax on T, still exists gets at the fundamental problem of taxation and representation. All right, taxation and representation. So you have this smoldering resentment, right, that still exists within the colonies. It was true that the British were still pursuing pretty aggressively smugglers and illegal trade that erupted into violence with the Gatsby affair. This was an incident where the colonists burned a custom ship a custom ship was the type of ship that would arrest people for smuggling and illegal trade. When the British opened up an investigation to try and find those who were responsible for destroying this British custom ship, nobody talked, right? So no one talked. And uh, the people responsible were never brought to justice. And so the British really came away from this incident feeling like the entire colonies themselves had gotten rotten, that it wasn't just a few bad apples, but in fact, all the colonists are essentially rotten to the core. Meanwhile, the colonists set up a communication network. The committees of correspondence were a communication network between the colonists. This was a way for especially people like Samuel Adams, who was uh, instrumental in setting this up, this was a way for the colonists to communicate with one another kind of off the grid, away from formal lines of communication, which might get them caught with British authorities. And so you see kind of the beginnings of what we might call like a shadow government for the United States being built kind of off the grid, so to speak. Now, again, things had settled down for a couple of years until the Tea Act. And what's interesting about the Tea Act is that Initially, when the Tea Act was passed in 1773, it had nothing to do with the colonies or very little to do with the colonies themselves. It was passed because the British East India Company was about to go bankrupt. And the question was how to save this company. And so what uh, the British Parliament did was to pass the Tea Act. And that is to say that only tea from the British East India Company can be uh, bought in the colonies, All right? So the idea is how do we save this company that's bankrupt? Well, let's get rid of all the competition. Let's make it so that in the 13 colonies, this is the only tea that you're gonna buy. And so if you can only buy it from the British East India Company, then that's gonna save the company and it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be sort of an economic protectionist type of move. However, as we know, if you're forcing the colonists to buy tea from this company, what are they gonna be forced to pay? And that of course is the tea tax. And so things begin to unravel once again because the Tea Act forces the colonies to pay the tea tax. The interesting thing is that the price of tea actually went down. It wasn't a matter of how much they were paying. It was the principle about taxation and representation. And so that really began this slogan and this chant once again, especially in places that were being cracked down on by British authorities like the Northeast, in which you know all that illegal trade was being uh, you know prosecuted pretty pretty intensely, and so the colonists protested. What you had was in many of these port cities, uh, some you know some south, but primarily north. Um, you know, colonists went out on the docks and refused to unload the tea. So these ships full of tea would come, and the colonists would go out and refuse to unload them because once you unload them, then you have to pay the tax that violates taxation and representation. In most places, that's essentially what the crisis and protests amounted to, but in Boston, it was different, where the governor of Boston said that 
that T is going to be unloaded no matter what. Essentially, that ship can't leave until the T is unloaded. And so this started a, a very intense debate within Boston about what to do with this ship full of T sitting out in the Boston Harbor. The colonists didn't want to unload it. The governor was pretty adamant that it was going to be unloaded. And so rather than unloading the tea and, and paying the tax on it, uh, essentially what the Boston colonists did was to dump the tea into the harbor. And of course, this is known as the Boston Tea Party. Rather than unload it and pay the tax, throw it all in the harbor. This got an enormous and visceral reaction from Parliament. Parliament's reaction to this is very strict and very heavy-handed. Whereas before we had seen that Parliament was more or less willing to kind of be flexible, here they're not. They pass a series of laws called the Coercive Acts. So this is in response to the Tea Party, right? In response to the Tea Party. They were targeted only at Massachusetts. Massachusetts was the colony responsible for the tea, so they're the ones being punished. And it included a, a number of different uh, laws. And so we'll just go ahead and list what were part of these coercive acts. The Port Act closed Boston Harbor or Boston Port until the colonists paid for the tea. All right, so the port would be closed until the tea was paid for. The Government Act disbanded the Massachusetts Assembly, right? So where the colonists had met with one another, that was now disbanded. Um, the Justice Act moved trials to England. So if there was a British soldier that was um, charged with maybe harassing the colonists or shooting or killing the colonists, that trial would now be held in England. The colonists interpreted that as, well, they would get off easy, right? That, that, that essentially British soldiers could do whatever they want because the law didn't apply to them, specifically guys like John Adams, who was very adamant, a lawyer himself, very adamant about having a fair and equal uh, judicial system. The Quartering Act, we should know what that is by now. That is to house soldiers, Right, the old quartering act had actually expired, so a new one was put on the books. And so all of these things together make up the coercive acts, right? That's all those things together. To add insult to injury or salt into the wound or whatever you want to call it, British Parliament also passed the Quebec Act. This was religious tolerance for Catholics in Canada. All right, now recall, Quebec was initially founded by the French. A lot of French people lived in Eastern Canada. In the Seven Years' War, the British took over Canada, so now they were ruling over a large French Catholic population. And as relations began to improve there, uh, England moved towards toleration for Catholics. And this was seen in the eyes of the colonists, who were English-speaking Protestants, that Britain was being very harsh on them, but yet these French-speaking Catholics, their enemies who they've been wanting to kill for hundreds of years, uh, that the parliament was being sort of like nice to them. So what exactly is going on here? Why is parliament specifically targeting fellow English-speaking Protestants and really sort of laying the hammer down on them? And so for a lot of kind of everyday Protestant colonists who held their religious convictions to be the most important things in the world, and for a lot of people that was, this was in fact the most egregious part of it. In fact, the colonists themselves considered these laws to be so terrible that they referred to the coercive acts as the intolerable acts. We simply, as the 13 colonies, could not, could not tolerate it. Now, the goal of the coercive acts was to isolate Massachusetts, right? That was the goal, isolate Massachusetts. Instead, it had the very opposite reaction. And once again, uh, when paying attention to themes, we're going to see that this actually had the response of uniting the other colonies, that the other colonies looked at Massachusetts and said that these laws, the Port Act, the Government Act, the Justice Act, the Quartering Act, these are unacceptable. And so rather than isolate Massachusetts, 
Instead, what Great Britain actually did was to unite the other colonies to defend Massachusetts. Because if Parliament could do this, if Parliament could disband the Massachusetts Assembly, they could disband any assembly. If they could uh, close down their port, they could close down any port. And so this led to once again, and you have some depictions here of uh, right here, this is an image of the Gatsby, the custom ship that the colonists destroyed. You have a cartoon here about the coercive acts, the way that the British, this is supposed to be, uh, if you see this figure right here, this is supposed to be uh, the colonies right here. And you have the British kind of pouring tea down their throats and kind of mocking and laughing in the background. But this led to what we might call another, maybe third if we're keeping track, meeting of the colonies. Now recall the Stamp Act led to the Stamp Act Congress. The Seven Years War led to the Albany Congress. These are examples of when the colonies got together and met. What crisis presented a reason for 13 colonies to formally come together? And once again, the coercive acts or the intolerable acts as the colonists refer to them, created the conditions for the colonies to once again come together. This is about 10 years after the Stamp Act. And the reason why they're coming together is to defend Massachusetts and to demand removal of the intolerable acts. All right, defend or uh, demand the removal of the intolerable acts. So Massachusetts, their uh, assembly has been disbanded. But that doesn't prevent the colonists from meeting. The Massachusetts Provincial Congress, this is what we might call like a shadow government. So even though they're locked out of where they were supposed to formally meet, it's been made illegal for them to meet, they still meet together. They pass the Suffolk's Resolves, which again demands the repeal to the Intolerable Acts, right, by this shadow government. And in 1774 in Philadelphia, you have a meeting of 12 colonies, except Georgia doesn't go, but all 12 colonies meet and they create a unified response. And again, this idea of a united response is important because again, what did the colonies learn from the Stamp Act? The lesson learned from the Stamp Act was if you want to get parliament to back down, you have to work together. You have to create a united response. And so that's what the um, idea is behind the first Continental Congress is to create one united response, get Parliament to back down from the intolerable acts. And what the colonists essentially put forward at the first Continental Congress, their petition to the, uh, to the British authorities, the king and the parliament, one, repeal of the coercive acts, right? We know that. Uh, two, to put pressure on the British to do this. They're going to demand that the colonies not import or not consume British goods. This once again is to boycott. It once again asks groups like the Daughters of Liberty to again get on that uh, homespun movement so that they don't have to buy British goods or British textiles. They're going to ask because of the Boston Massacre, because violence has been used, they're going to ask the colonists to prepare their militias Right? This is a dramatically different type of approach than during the Stamp Act. There wasn't really the fear of a, of a British armed response. But if the Boston Massacre proved something, it proved that the British were willing to massacre the colonists out in the streets and not really punish their own for doing so. So at the First Continental Congress, they asked the colonies to prepare your militias just in case. And in order to enforce the laws, they're gonna create an association. And the association essentially is the enforcement mechanism, specifically for this idea of boycotting. So whereas before boycotting was more or less done, uh, you know, there of course was a lot of social pressure to boycott British goods that if you were caught kind of wearing something from Great Britain, you were considered to be unpatriotic and might be uh, threatened or at least ridiculed by your peers. The Continental Association is going to create a more strong kind of enforcement of that boycotting. It's, it's, it is viewed sometimes maybe as the first law of the United Colonies. However, still important, right, is the fact that 
they are still British subjects. There is certainly a strong sense of loyalty that even in 1774, we're only two years away from the American Revolution, two years away from independence. There was still this pledge of loyalty. The colonists still very much considered themselves to be British citizens. The first Continental Congress said, we'll send this petition right across the Atlantic Ocean. Back in those days, it took maybe two or three months for that petition to go there and back because of the nature of transport and travel. And in one year, we'll meet again at the Second Continental Congress. And it's what happens between the First Continental Congress and the Second Continental Congress that really begins to push the narrative of separating from the British Empire rather than just you know, getting rid of these specific laws.